Once upon a time, in a faraway land. What are fairy stories? The strange and wondrous place where nothing is as it seems. Magic mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest? Fairy is a perilous land. Before she found herself falling down what seemed to be a very deep it well. It is the place you visit. A world of dream. myth and magic. When the clock began to chime, the night, star sailed down through the sky. A mysterious voice began calling to the sad princess. She pricked her finger with her needle. Three drops of blood fell on In the In a trance, window. she followed the haunting sound of a winding tree. stairway to the top of the you tower. You can read along with me in your book. Let's begin now. With me today are Dave, the Weathered Wiseman, and Kamian. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, Dave? I am the Weathered Wiseman. Um, I've been working with my craft for decades, it feels like now. Most of my concentration is on healing um, the male spirit, working with nature. I mean, pretty much if I get the opportunity, I'm out in the woods and working in payroll. Can't miss that paycheck. <laughs> Kamian, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Of course. Uh, Kamian, I've been practicing a little over 40 years. Uh, primary focus is traditional witchcraft from the Welsh tradition, Hermetic Kabbalah, and chaos magic. Uh, founder of the, one of the founders of the Fellowship of the Phoenix, and also an ordained Nice, thank you. The tradition that came and mentioned, the Fellowship of the Phoenix, that we both uh, that we both come from, this season is the season of the explorer, and we've chosen some tales today that include a, an aspect of the queer spirit of the explorer and the masculine energies of witchcraft and fairy. Um, the tales that we'll be talking about today are The Golden Bird, collected by the Brothers Grimm, and The Queen Bee. The Golden Bird was obtained orally from an elderly female patient, colloquially known as Old Marie, in the Elizabeth Hospital in Marburg and written down by Wilhelm Grimm. The story is that she wouldn't tell the tales to the Brothers Grimm, so they had to find a child to go in and ask for stories. And when she would tell them to the child, Wilhelm would be in the other room writing them down. The second story, The Queen Bee, was sent by Albert, uh, Albert Ludwig Grimm, which surprisingly no relation to the Brothers Grimm. As I've said in our other episodes, I think the tales are non-allegorical. There is not one single interpretation that the tales are meant to mask. Um, because of that, there's a myriad, perhaps, an infinite number of ways to interpret the tales, but one usually will not encompass all aspects of the story. Uh, initial reactions. We'll start with the we'll start with the golden bird. For me, it elucidated the complexities of psyche and the complexities of doing doing magic, right? Um, and and the sense that when we dive deep, it it. For me, a lot of times when we dive, when I dive deep, the best way to approach the situation is to look at it as an adventure and and go go all for it. Perfect. I, when I was reading it, I saw um, the opportunity. Well, a lot of um, concentration on underestimating people um, and not making a prejudgment before um, actually letting the person try to do what they're going to do. I love that you brought up the adventure aspect of it, because again, in the spirit of the explorer, that is one reason the, both these tales called out to me is that they are, they're quests and they are adventures. The, the golden bird begins with the setting of a king who has a pleasure garden. And I love saying that phrase, but the king has a pleasure garden. And in the pleasure garden is a golden tree that bears golden fruit in some translations golden apples golden apples make me think of the garden of hesperides 
Um, of course, also the the fruit that the Norse gods ate to remain young and virile. It also took me back to the, the biblical um, myth of the Garden of Eden, um, yes. the tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, with especially since so many times it's uh, associated with apples. When we talk about the of- mythology of Eden, there's the there's two trees so we have the tree of mm-hmm. knowledge but we also have the tree of life which is another possible mm-hmm. contender I was okay comment okay of, there is this vagueness of, of 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 why is the king you know if, if the tree's bearing fruit uh why is he so worried about an apple being taken right uh it's kind of mm-hmm. like and it goes back to the garden of eden like and that's that's the gnostic myth of of you know god well, the lesser Yahweh says, don't eat that apple. But of course, the greater transcendent Yahweh says, yeah, eat it. Because then, then my creation reaches perfection. So was he just greedy? Those were his golden apples from his tree in his pleasure garden. Maybe no one else was supposed to take them. Um, I, I, I don't know. It's, you know. it's a possibility. In some versions of the tale... It begins with an alternate beginning, which the Grimm's do the Grimm's do chronicle in their notebooks that some variants of the tale begin with a sickly or blind king who has a vision of a phoenix who lives in a faraway land. I think that's a I think that's a a, a great way to set up the MacGuffin as well. That the phoenix mm-hmm. comes in a vision. Um, in the original publication of the tale, the first edition of the tales. We next meet a gardener who has three sons. In later editions, that's been simplified so that it's only the king and his three sons. But in the first edition of the tale, yeah, it switches to a gardener who has three sons, and each son takes a turn trying to find out where the missing fruit is going. And only the youngest son is able to catch the golden bird who comes and steals a golden apple and flies away. Specifically, the third son lays down under the tree and watches until precisely at the last strike of midnight, the golden bird descends and steals a fruit and flies away. The the gardener's son looses an arrow at the golden bird, but all he does is all he does is catch one feather. When they're utilizing, you know, it, it's interesting that, that that some of the stories begin with a sick king, which then that kind of goes back to a Thurian Fisher King, right, aspects. So one question that I kept asking is, why is it the youngest son, you know, and why why are they flipping this this between old, you know, usually it's always the oldest kids that, that get, a, get a run with everything. Um, and what blipped up in my mind then was also of Cain and Abel. And I'm and I'm I'm wondering in the Bible, do we know which one's older? Uh, and and you know, uh, so I wonder if there's a sense of that, if there's a redeeming quality that that's supposed to be brought out through the youngest. So. In the story that that I was reading too, the youngest son was the least trusted. The king had less confidence in him than the older two. So in essence, the younger felt like he may have had to prove something. Um, and it was him that, and it, I also thought it particularly curious that this all happened at midnight. At midnight, exactly, both the older sons went to sleep. But it was a few minutes after midnight that the youngest saw the bird. I have so many things I want to say um, here, and I and I'm so happy that both of you are bringing up a lot of topics that I will forget to mention otherwise. Um, so, of course, there is a logical explanation of lineage at the time that these stories came out. So, the the youngest son would receive the least, or maybe nothing. So, these stories go against uh, the tradition of of the eldest son uh, getting all the inheritance, but also uh, um, it's an underdog tale, right? 
because mm-hmm. it's a way for the youngest son to get the inheritance that otherwise he's he's not going to have. And the youngest son also, again, realistically would have to venture out and make his own fortune because he wouldn't rely on an inheritance like the like the eldest son would. Um, these stories, both of these stories come from a tradition of uh, a tradition that includes many tales called uh, simpleton stories or sometimes whittling or dumbling tales, but simpleton. And I can't help but think about how was the term pagan used in Roman conquest? It was a way to describe country bumpkins, simpletons. And, you know, I do, I do not think that was, that this is, you know, coding in the story or anything like that, but I, but I do think there is a similarity there. And there's almost a nocturnal aspect of that third son. So um, I'm, you know, shying away from, from biblical interpretations, but even in witchcraft lore, we do, and, and Gnostic lore, we have the genealogies that come from Seth, you know, and from Cain and from Abel and from the various sons. And only some of those bloodlines are considered witched. Mm-hmm. And midnight, and I, you know, lo- lo- lots of people now like to say 3 a.m., the witching hour, that's modern. And, and right. from from my understanding, that's, that's you know, that's modern horror movie tropes. Initially, it was midnight, midnight to 1 a.m. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Came in, come I, on. I, I want to, can I just comment of of i think we actually have a moment in modern history of shows how um fairy tales still play because um there's a book out called spare where the younger has you know the younger prince is having to make his own fortune because he's now going to be king so um i think it's it's funny that you know we're constantly still living the fairy tales no matter what we we want to say we're removed from it What's the other cable show? Is it called Inheritance or something like that? But where it's sort of like a Trump style family and all the children are fighting over who's going to take over the company? Right. Uh, It's an HBO Max. uh, Yeah. But again, you know, it's, I mean, it's the same plot. Succession. Thank you. And see, for some reason, this, the movie Stardust popped into my head too by Neil Gaiman. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. With all the the seven ghosts, yes, yep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. So, okay. Um, anything else we want to talk about the apple or the garden in here? I am curious about one of the things that crossed my mind, and I'm constantly one of those that's going to question everything. What did the apple represent to the king? There has to be more there than just the golden apple. And why, like you said, if it's continually bearing fruit, what's what's wrong with one apple being gone, two apples being gone? If that tree is constantly producing fruit, go ahead. I actually think it, I actually think it's greed, and I think that is a great example of how our desires as witches and magicians lead us on a path of magic and Mm -hmm. i think in my view uh, an aspect of evolution and what happens in the story is it starts with the golden apple but then the quest ends up being for the bird because they see the feather of truth the pure gold feather right Mm -hmm. uh so comment of that so with you comment of of it relating back to witchcraft though um ever the need to be self-aware because if, it, if, 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 if the younger son is, is moving to retrieve the, the apples per se, then it's just feeding the greed. And so then the quest is, is actually then the filtering down of what is the true quest. And not to give it away, but then one wonders like, well, is the real true quest to kill the fox and really release all the curses, you know? So We're gonna get to that. We are definitely yeah. gonna get to that. And who, <laughs> who actually is the protagonist, who actually is pulling the strings. So, you know, the Mm -hmm. quest is for this golden bird, but something we talked about in our last episode is there are other forces in nature that we are collaborating with. And what was implied but left unsaid is they all have their own own goals and aims. 
And that doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. have to be antagonist to us. They can give them reasons to be working with us, but we have to be cognizant that we are helping them achieve their goals as well. But we jump ahead. Okay. <laughs> to the end of the story. Um, so yes. Well, but that uh, too, like, like in the pursuit of the golden apples, um, when the son, the youngest son got the feather, the one feather and the king heard that it was worth more than the kingdom itself. It stirs more of that greed, more of that. Okay. I've got this apple tree. I've got these gold apples. Now I've got to got that. I've got to have that bird. And, so, and if we push the greed, is the king just the demiurge? I mean, if we want to like mm -hmm. push it to like a creative force, is the king just the demiurge? And we're just mm -hmm. possibly, uh, possibly, um, especially with his with his pleasure garden of creation and and gardeners and sons. Mm -hmm. um, this is a common trope in many fairy tales, specifically the male. Uh, the male adventures like that like the fairy tales that focus on a male on a male hero is it's something the father lost or requires and often it's a king and a prince but not always um and in the variant of the tale where the father is seeking the bird for healing purposes is is repeated in a lot of tales. There's uh, one called the water of life and, and many tales like this, where the children go on a quest for something that the father needs. Um, do we interpret that in a, in a material genealogical sense or something that goes more between us and our ancestors and spirits? I, I think that's kind of the twist that one, you know, I, I think that's part of, that's part of the, the personal uh, decision of an individual of how they're going to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. engage it, right? Because as you were talking and as you brought it up of, you know, the typical male hero's journey, uh, in grand cases, you know, it's actually, even though there's an ego component of it, it's still a, a grandiose component to the community, right? And so if we if we want to like tag on to the Arthurian myth, well, if the king is sick, that means the land is sick, the kingdom is sick, you know? So by the youngest son taking these actions, he's not only just restoring his, the king, his father, but he's also restoring the whole, the whole land and the whole people. Um, One way I interpreted these uh, based on something, again, we said in our last episode is that in that sense, in, in the beginning, um, again, plot device of setting up the MacGuffin, the king is an aspect of the hero. And, and I think that applies to the idea of the demiurge as well, because oftentimes the demiurge can also represent our individual consciousness or our ego. When the children in the beginning set out for this quest to find the golden bird. It begins with the oldest son and at the edge of a forest or at the border of a forest, the prince encounters a fox. My first thought there is, and I'm an, I'm an oldest son, so I can speak from experience here. Cockiness and ego kicks in a lot. I mean, think about it. This fox, first of all, you're encountering a talking fox but you still think you know more think about how many times in life where we encounter those talking foxes but we still think that we're smarter than that even if uh, you can even take it with our station in life this son this eldest son since he was going to inherit the throne is coming from a place of privilege anyway so what does he need? He's already got it all. All he's trying to do is hunt down this bird. And what help can that probably mangy looking little fox give him? Well, speaking as someone whose totem is a fox, <laughs> always trust the fox. No, um, 
but, but uh, uh, I think there's also a consideration of here these guys have been living in a castle, etc., and they're going out on their this adventure. Um, they probably don't trust nature. So, of course, mm -hmm. if you can meet a talking fox. And then, you know, if you've heard any, any fables or whatever, well, foxes are pretty tricky. So, I'm, yeah, it's very easy, like what Dave was saying is, that's not, I'm not going to, I'm going to trust my own gut, uh, not trust um, that somebody else might have the bigger picture. Foxes are indeed tricky. And one of, maybe that is one of the reasons, but they are considered mercurial in their planetary correspondences. And I love the, I love the planetary symbolism then in this tale that we don't have Mercury, but we have a mercurial spirit, a, a, a spirit that can guide us and inform us and is even met at that liminal space at the edge of the forest, similar to like at a crossroads. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, like you said, Dave, in fact, the line in the story is the, the prince says, I'd be a fool to take advice from an animal. So he does not have the animistic beliefs and sensibilities. Uh, he's coming at this from the, from the logical. And of course, he thinks that he'd be a fool to take that advice. So he goes into the brightly lit and festive inn and has a good time. Um, nothing, we don't know that anything bad happens to him. He just enjoys himself there. And since he does not return, because now he's partying at the inn, the next son takes up the quest. And at the border of the forest, he meets this same mercurial guide. And although he receives the advice from the fox also that he should take, he should take the sadder looking inn the older brother calls out from the window and says, come on in. And so the middle brother does, and he starts, he starts drinking and living large in the inn as well. Finally, the youngest son meets the fox at the border of the forest, and he trusts him. Of course, this is also the son who's considered a simpleton. So one of the things that stuck out here for me was the method of travel. The fox asked him to sit on his tail, and then it was like, zoom, we're there. Which I think also could fall into that mercurial. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and specifically, it says, yeah, specifically, it says that they speed over like stones and twigs or obstacles, which is <laughs> what we call one of the reasons we call to mercurial spirits is for road opening and and obstruction removal so we see the uh -huh. we see the example right in the story again this is where i love um well i guess a key component to any fox is the tail but in in japan you know the tails are always important when it comes to foxes and and that it's utilized that way i like that the reason for staying in the shabbier or sadder inn um, isn't necessarily just because it's shabby, but he spends a quiet night. So we get this idea of, mm -hmm. of a moment of contemplation and preparing for the journey ahead. Is that a good way to say that? Yeah. And I also... Okay, and this I'm not stereotyping in any way, shape, or form, but think about as gay men. We're always going to be attracted to the shiny and the glittery. <laughs> so when you see the party house going, your first inclination is, I'm going to go have fun. Looking at the shabby place, yeah, why would I want to go in there? What does that have to offer? It's like your brain doesn't compute that you need rest for the journey. You need rest for the adventure. And once they got inside the, the, the party house or the party inn, they stayed, they got comfortable. And the adventure stopped there. And there isn't anything inherently wrong with the with the more festive inn. Um, mm -hmm. And what happens, you know, the second son runs into uh, advice 
you know, from peer pressure. He, you know, he, he listens mm-hmm. to his brother's advice, just like we might listen to our friend's advice. But the festive in, I would say, is for the populace. And the mm-hmm. path of the third son is the one that would not appeal to most people. I'll leave it at that, you know. Um, any, anything from you, no, Kimmy? And, I, and I, think, I, I think there is a statement of, of humility, but not, not in the sense of um, giving up or even at this point sacrifice. It merely is just staying in tune with what, what is your, what's the true path? So, I mean, in reality, you know, this is the first, this is the first uh, task on the quest of, well, you have door number one or door number two. Um, mm-hmm. are, you, are you committed? You know? Um, yeah. I, so that's... Well, and keeping that focus and not getting distracted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the trials and the requirements of witchcraft are not things that, that would necessarily appeal to the masses. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think, I think that's, I think that's a uh, easy way of, of looking at it, you know, without necessarily being too, uh, um, austere or something, you know, it's just, these aren't necessarily the mysteries that would appeal to most people. Um, after leaving to, the quiet, to, you know, in, practical yeah. magic. we want to be ordinary. Exactly. Yeah. Like, and that's, that's what I was man. thinking. You, you, you come into you come into the craft expecting the sparks and the the uh, fireworks. You don't anticipate the walks in the woods, the quiet times. <laughs> and there's no there's no there's no problem with sparkles and and, and glitter. Like right. all of all of that stuff is uh, something we should be attracted to. But he's keeping his eye on the even brighter sparkle, the golden bird. You mm-hmm. know, it's going to pay off in the long run. You know, he's 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 right. going for a you know a larger payoff than than the momentary one in the inn. Um, after leaving the inn, he meets the fox again, and the fox again gives him advice and gives him um, a road opening ride to another castle. Um, here he's going to find the golden bird. Interestingly, the description of that golden cage is it's just hanging there for decoration. So he decides to dress up the golden bird in something that is just ornamental, but not necessarily of uh, useful function and form. Uh, What do you all think about that? So for me, uh, I think the sense is that... um... The wooden cage is is an assessment of the truth of reality. So what is what does gold usually mean, and why is gold? Because it's incorruptible; it doesn't oxidize. That's why it's it's taken on this form of, ooh, if I'm going to wear anything, it's going to be gold, right? Um, whereas the wooden cage represents of this is this is things live and die, things things grow and then rot, right? And I think I think there's a statement there of of. This quest is about knowing knowing the truth of what it is to be be human and to be, you know, the youngest son who who could who still has the possibility of taking the throne if 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 he achieves this adventure. So at least for me that's that's what spoke to me. One of the things that kind of stuck out with me with the golden cage and the wooden cage is inside the wooden cage the the golden bird stands out. He doesn't fade into the background. Once he's put into the golden cage, he's not special anymore. I like that. He just blends in. And, I mean, isn't that kind of the way that that we approach the craft? I mean, we are, and the phrase, I, I don't like the phrase, but I'll, I'll, I'll use it here. We're magic in mundane world. We stand out. You put us in a world that's all magic. We're not special. We're just a part of it. So we're here to make a difference. How about, do you have thoughts about the golden bird specifically? Birds often in these tales because they are somewhere between 
uh, earth and the sky, and they can they can transcend those realms. Usually represent something lofty or spiritual. Uh, do mm -hmm. you have thoughts about the golden bird itself? In my mind, I visualized a peacock. The minute I heard golden bird, just because of the plumage and the the regality of the bird and with I, I have a bird and i know a lot of their personality i used to work with birds constantly so it's that element of flight that element of being unreachable to a degree but also that, like you said, that loftiness, that um, that just within reach, but still it's going to take effort. And within the within a magical frame of mind, uh, 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 that that same thought process, I kind of put in intent versus workings versus the end result with the bird um which this may or may not make sense but i look at the bird in the cage as the intent but that final process this bird apparently gets loose at night so he has the freedom to come and go and He's always within reach, but still there's that that freedom, that that ability to surpass what humans have the access to. Make sense or no? That bring that brings up a good question that I actually had not thought about. Um, is the bird coming and going, or is the king of that castle sending him out nightly to steal the mm. golden apples? Um similar to a ba going on going on uh an astral flight you know a soul journey at night just that would make sense just because a, the apples are visible to the youngest son when he goes to get the bird the apples yeah, are in so the there. apples are strewn about um and you mentioned the peacock and since since you bring that up as well Kamian, do you think there is a luciferian aspect to this bird and its symbolism. So as I, um, I don't, I don't think so because it's it's not so what because there's like no sense of transformative. It, it's more of just the the regality of it and the out of reach or the soaring um, wide scope of vision. So and then when we of course we'll see with the other components of the story. I think I think this is the journey of the aspect the the aspects that one must claim to be a king. Right, so this represents maybe the clear vision of uh, and maintaining um, the full range of, of observation of your kingdom, something like that, right? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, because even we, do, granted, this is a golden bird. Uh, no, I don't see the lucifer. I'm not seeing that transformative uh, sure. elucidation. I, I see it sure. more as a skill set. Um, this might be similar to what you're saying, Dave, about intent, but I thought of the bird as an aspect of inspiration, um, mm -hmm. um, similar to astral, uh, like tarot card, the star, maybe because of the lineage that I come from, but I couldn't help but think of the golden bird as, as similar to the phoenix. And then from the phoenix... Uh, a firebird, such as in, in Russian mythology, mm -hmm. a firebird. And from there, even more this idea of, of celestial influence or inspiration. Um, that is not necessarily a correct interpretation at all, but those are some of the things that jumped out for me. But also in that idea of inspiration, that it does get the quest going. I'm wondering if there's an aspect of alchemical sulfur in this when we mm. get to fire and inspiration and its function in the plot narrative of the story. 
that doesn't really move torque but I can see how that works alchemically, right? Where maybe uh, the bird is going to be sulfur, the horse is mercurial, and then the princess is earth. And, 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 and again, this goes back to then the kid is doing alchemy on himself, that he, so he's ready to be king. Yeah, I, I, I see that a lot. Now, horses, similar to the tarot card of the chariot, usually, again, symbolize some form of travel. And I, I guess that sounds too obvious. But specifically in, in um, magical and spiritual symbolism, um, travel between realms. So in like the chariot card, travel from one realm to a next to the astral realm or from um, a material level towards other realms of power, aka maybe deity. To be sure. And then I also think that there, we're, we're stair-stepping into um, greater and greater familiarity with self. So, you know, I've never had a bird as a pet, but I've had friends or, or and then if you have those that you actually, you know, that they live longer than you sometimes, right? You have a, you can only have a certain relationship with a bird. We, we can have a much greater f familiarity with horses, you know, uh, mm -hmm. right? And then finally he's, he's another human, you know? So I think there's also something to appreciate that there's, there's an increasing, I have a greater sense of consciousness on each step of this quest. I really like that, and and as we mentioned, the, the, there's a quicksilver or 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 a, a, a alchemical mercury as opposed to planetary mercury symbolism in here as well. Um, did you want to say anything, Dave? Before we, keep one on? of the things that constantly kind of rang true to my my thought process in this was he would listen to the fox to a point, and then that human nature takes over. And once the human nature takes over, that's when the trouble starts. The fox tells him, don't touch the golden saddle, don't touch the golden cage, but he does it anyway. He thinks, well, why should this bird be housed in a wooden cage? Let's do the gold. Why should this horse be in a plain leather saddle? Let's go for the gold one. And every time it ends up in chaos with his life being threatened. And, and is that not the, the fox mm -hmm. comes back? He keeps coming back to hell. But isn't that us with nature? Isn't that the way we are with magic, with nature, all of it? We think we know better. We always think we know better. And it gets us into trouble one way or another. I agree. And, you know, I, I F up rituals or spells occasionally and <laughs> do my working relationships become ruined forever, um, even though I may worry that, you know, in this example, in this example, the spirits understand, you know, and that doesn't mean that mm -hmm. we should outright ignore them. I have pictures of my ancestors staring at me right now, which is like... <laughs> It's like the watchful eye of, yeah, I know I haven't been tending as often as I should. Um, and again, that doesn't mean they're going to cut off relations with me. And I, I, I did want to point that out at some point. Well, and one thing that stuck out to me, too, is how many times do we get so caught up in ritual that we ignore, like, the ritual of, let's say, the, the horse with the saddle? Instead of listening to the spirit or the fox and doing it his way, how many times do we get so caught up in the ritual of what we think it should be and how it should work that we completely ignore what spirit says? And then again, like I said, we end up in a mess of trouble. That's when I think laughter comes into play. So, and yeah. I think that's, that's where experience is... We've all had those times where, how many times do I have to bloody light this candle? You know, because it keeps <laughs> getting blown out or the incense doesn't stay lit. And you just be like, all right, I get it. You don't want it. Let's move on. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we do get stuck in that. But for me, laugh at it and then mm -hmm. 
move on. Um, and and I think I think we'll eventually circle around of yes, the fox keeps coming back, but there's the ulterior motive, and um, and at least for me, that's the key thing that I always point out uh, that why it's not a selfish way that we engage and we work with spirits, but we're all one. We all all want to get to the attunement or the vibration that we all want to be. And and if we're going to communicate and work together, there there's a there's a there's an understanding that's made. And then as soon as, and at least for me with my spirits, of if we're not all on the same page, that's all right, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and consent is number one in magic, you know? And you can always say no. And yep. uh, yeah. So similar to you mentioned how the, the, the identification of the animal, I'm gonna continue calling them MacGuffins, um, increases from the bird to the horse and will, you know, increase another stage. There's, um, uh, really similar to that. There's this, um, this symbolism too, where the bird, if it was the inspiration, now the horse is in, in the example I gave, you know, um, a method of transporta- transportation, but it's something with ability. So now mm-hmm. you have the skill or ability to move to the next stage towards getting towards what you're working towards. Um, and what we are told is that now he's going to go not to a, you know, not to a golden bird or a golden horse, but a golden castle. And in that golden castle is a princess that he must bring back. You know, we, we discussed, and it wasn't until this moment, like, oh yeah, this is very trad crafty in this sense. Cause this is where you can see a new form of the goddess, right? Um, when you reach reach this uh, one of the castles in, in traditional witchcraft, uh, and uh, and again, it's just always this juxtaposition of of something's being asked, or he he's kind of like, and and for whatever reason, he doesn't want to do it, and then of course gets him into trouble again, um, and, and and from a kabbalistic state. Um, you know, this is this is what everyone desires. Is is because when you get to the princess, you're at you're at the the root of creation, and from there you you know you can gain gain um, gain deeper wisdom. Yes, from a tradcraft stance, now we have he's reached a fourth castle, and in certain branches of tradcraft, specifically those that came from Cochrane, there actually is a system of four castles that are often used in relation to the witch's compass. Now, not all craft lineages use a compass or a circle. Um, and others, uh, other more ceremonial um, lineages or Wiccan lineages might use a circle and have something like watchtowers, um, which, could be, which could be similar. But we have now the fourth castle and in the fourth castle again lies the princess. I actually think there's um, maybe HGA uh, connotations with this princess as well. Um, um, if we look at the four castles and you compare them to Cochrane's, you c- could come up with you know various ways of lining these to go along with his symbolism. The castles were something I didn't necessarily expect to bring up until we moved into maybe Arthurian stories, but they're here. So, so we'll mention them at least that much. And the explorer's journey, when you look at it in this sense, now could be an aspect of setting that, setting that compass or a mythology used to set the compass. I love that in this story, particularly, we're starting to get um, specific guides and symbols that we can refer back to in the future. So we have the fox as this mercurial spirit and the other, the other, um, the other goals as well, of course, the golden bird and the golden horse and, and the, um, I thinking of a celestial princess. Um, but the mercurial spirit, especially as the fox, I really enjoy. One as the mm-hmm. idea of a of a, of a animist um, worldview, but as a 
as a teacher from nature. And in his aspect as a mercurial spirit, I'm thinking of the spirit of Visago that was brought in. Um, it's He's in the Key of Solomon, but Paul Hewson um, uses him in, let's see, can we see this? Paul Hewson uses him in his book, Mastering Witchcraft, which has been influential into the modern revival of traditional witchcraft. And you can use a... A uh, ritual that is in there that's been taken from the old grimoires, however, given a less domineering um, witchcraft style to meet Visago as a mercurial spirit who will um, who will help guide you and introduce you to other spirits. Um, recently, we lost Jake Stratton Kent, who, although he's mostly... I could even say venerated by uh, Somal, uh, Solomonic ceremonial magicians. He initially described himself uh, as, a, as a witch. And in his version of the true grimoire, he also gives a process where you meet a, a guide spirit who then is going to bring the other goetic spirits and introduce you. And... Um, we see that in the story too, where this fox is taking him to the various castles to find the other mm -hmm. elements and spirits that work there. Um, and even every castle having a king, to go back to setting the compass, we can work with the Grimwarwick Four Kings of the Elements, um, which are listed in... in um, Trithemius and Agrippa and can be found easily online. So even if you don't follow necessarily um, Cochrane's description of the castles and the kings, there's a long lineage of um, practice that uses these four kings of the elements from Agrippa and others. So in my tradition, we don't use quarters like that. There's just the central with the fountain. <clears throat> and then there's this, then there's you can think some people call it as another castle that then is it's what you turn the you know you turn the mill around right um mm -hmm. so it's a it's a specific central castle but yeah interesting and i am is familiar that... with the witch's compass and i think that it's funny that one of the um representatives is a is a crow or a bird and then that it kind of moves around to i mean you've got all the different era elements you've got the snake you've got the the toad my path doesn't necessarily follow the the that predict particular tradition mm -hmm. um but i do see the logic in that the golden castle now the princess comes out at midnight to bathe every night again we have midnight and i i just keep thinking of this as like a celestial castle and this goddess um you know in in the uh in the Milky Way or Sea of Tranquility out there bathing. Um, do you have other thoughts about about her? One of the things that stuck out to me was he was to approach her at the time that she went to the bathhouse, which is a very vulnerable time. Hey. I mean, if you think about it, she's probably not wearing much at all, or if anything. So she's completely exposed. Um, and at that point, that's when he's supposed to approach her in her vulnerability. And he's supposed to kiss her on the cheek. I mean, my brain went in 50 different directions here. So I'm curious as far as what your thoughts on it came in and, and Aaron. So, <laughs> well, it, it it is interesting because the fox does say like don't let her get take leave of her parents and you're like mm -hmm. okay you know um rapey yeah, yeah. <laughs> very much so yeah um and well but she's giving you know she's she's like okay i'll go with you just let me tell my parents that i'm leaving um so yeah that's that is definitely a puzzlement uh so that part comes after we've already had the golden bird who 
who doesn't need to go, shouldn't go in the cage that's only made for decoration. And then the golden horse who should not be put in the golden saddle. And, and with both of those, I think about like doing our work just for show or, or showing Mm -hmm. something, even if we didn't do the work just for show, making a big display about it afterwards, which then makes me think about the um, directive to be silent. And, and this could fall into that as well, you know, in a, in a not so flattering um, example. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and I guess this, then the subtlety is the only thing that, that, that's, uh, is that then treating the princess is that she is a goddess, right? That, that ultimately that I'm engaging the divine and that's why I'm not under normal human standards and expectations socially right <laughs> that by by sweeping this this beautiful young lady off by off with myself without telling anybody is not is not you know mm-hmm. taboo right so uh yeah it's, and so maybe that's what it is 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 it's it's him coming to terms like i'm actually engaging the divine this is not just um i'm streaking away with a half half naked woman mm-hmm and the kiss, I think of just the unification aspect of it, maybe. Mm-hmm. So he's he's made a pact, or he or he's united with a, a spiritual aspect, whether it's of something external or or uh, something that's connected with him. I, I also just kind of glancing at it again. The interesting thing of everyone wakes up at the same time. It's it's like being in that the kids in a meditative state, and then that one voice of the ego says something, and then boom, you know your your no thingness mind is gone. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's and that again is setting the scene of we're obviously in altered space. Whenever he enters into a castle, he's in an altered state, and and whenever he shifts the gears out of it um, by suggestion of his spirit animal, the fox. This is how you stay in a certain tone of consciousness. Right. If you don't, and you're out. It's like you wake up. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's also interesting to point out that that it's all interconnected. We come now to the part that I find maybe most perplexing, um, because he's caught, because he does let he does relent and let let the princess say goodbye to the, her her father. Um, her father, another king, decides to let him have the princess if he can move the mountain that has been blocking his view. If the bird was was an intent or an inspiration and the horse was the necessary skill or ability to move on to the next level, which was to unite with the princess, which was something he didn't even know he wanted in the beginning. But now he's now he's gone to a whole uh, castle of gold and united with the spirit there. Perhaps his perception and worldview need to change now. If you have the faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can move mountains. Which, I mean, this this prince... <laughs> if you if you look at the prince and his approach, I mean, when he's told to move the mountain to essentially get it out of the way, his first approach is physical. I mean, if you think about it, when we encounter a problem, how many times is our first thought, let me do this. Let me manage it my way. And then the more he dug, the more he shoveled, the less he felt like he could do it. So then the fox tells him, you go sleep, go rest, let me take care of it. Again, the fox comes through. And then when they wake up the next morning, the mountain's gone. Which, again, the fox represents that that spirit, that that mercurial entity that that can do things that we can't 
I mean, he's essentially moved a mountain out of the way. So I really like that he does the physical act, even though it seems impossible. Mm -hmm. And not only not only does he right. try, you know, to physically move the mountain, but he specifically tries for seven days. And, you mm -hmm. know, like, if, for the length of a seven day candle, let's say. So not only does he keep that, you know, keep that intent going that seven day candle going, he's doing the physical material work that needs to go along with it, even though it seems hopeless. And he's about ready to despair. But as often might happen in these longer workings, even if it doesn't look like it's going your way during day three, four, whatever, the the spirits we have relationships with that we're working with that spell with it can push it through. Mm -hmm. But the spirit saw that he, he waited. He saw that he saw that the prince put in the necessary material work for those seven days too. So, you know, in, in our instances, if there are things where there's mundane actions that need to be taken, we have to do those as well. I, I, I think it's also to point out that the king gets caught in his own trap of, of, <sighs> He has to, you know, he made the offer thinking he wouldn't have to fulfill it, but trapped by his own word, word, right? Um, yeah. And with that little comment, then is at first when you read it, like, oh, here we go again, another king with his ego, you know, as <laughs> for his view. But in reality, it's it's him not wanting to release his daughter, and when but mm -hmm. trapped by it. Um, That's so funny because better. that's so funny because that idea of staying. Um, of being tricked by being true to the word, you know, specifically is such a common aspect of, of fairy dealings. Um, and I mean, magical fairy dealings, but also a common trope in fairy tales. And yet in this one, I actually assumed like, yeah, he's really sick of his view being blocked by that damn mountain. <laughs> So I, yeah, I was happy for him. I said, "Oh, he has he has a good view now," um, and yeah, that is that is a common trope because it is instructive into the ways of dealing with fairy. They will be true to their word, and they may try to trick you with that word. Um, mm -hmm. So now he has the princess, he has the horse, and he has the golden bird, and the fox says, "Okay, but you need all three. and and he does. He he's able to keep all three by following specifically the the fox's guidance now he finds out that his two brothers who are having fun in the festive inn are to be hung and he he buys their freedom um they betray him and push him into a well take the bird the golden horse and this princess or goddess and present them as their achievements to the king back home. And we have our hero in the bottom of a well. First, that whole trauma again started with the fox asking for his payment, finally. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we're, we don't quite understand why do you want to get your head cut off, your paws cut off? But uh, again, the kids, I mean, there's the major, you know, there's a, there's an, a different conflict than he had had in the past of, of, you know, okay, the fox told me to do this. Well, I went with my better judgment. Here is, I mean, the kid's probably like, I, I don't want to kill you. What? You know? So, but again, not listening to nature messes you up. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think there's also the thing there. Well, obviously, whether the brothers were partying and all this stuff, they've learned nothing. Zilch, zero. If anything, they probably, you know, they're, well, you throw them in a well. Very much Joseph of the Amazing Technical Dream Code. <laughs> I was actually going to say that <laughs> same <laughs> thing. It was very much, it, that's the one thing that stood out for me so much. It was the story of Joseph and, Joseph and the Code of Many Colors all over again. Um, the brothers wanting the power that he had inherited, essentially. And... Um, it was easier just throw him down a well, get rid of him, tell the father a different story. They've got the, the goods on him, and they get their inheritance. Joseph is left behind. So, I mean, yeah, that just, oh, uh, that hit my head 
just right when I read it. And as a quest goes, you know, this almost seems like, oh my God, the story is never going to end. But this has to happen in the hero's journey, at least. Because, mm-hmm. you know, he's been going on, he's been, you know, he's been leveling up every time. And finally, he has to reach the lowest part. He has to find himself in the belly of the beast. In this case, a dry well. Mm-hmm. Well, who finds him in the dry well? Fox. And we still don't know why the F is the fox still sticking around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, the, the fox does pull him out, which uh, seems, again, like something almost... Well, the fox by this point has moved mountains, so the fox can do anything. The fox pulls him out of the dry well and warns him that he can't just go home now because there's guards uh, waiting for him in case he survived. So he has to disguise himself in poor man's clothes. Here again, there's an echo of what happened to the symbols that he collected. So now that he's gone through all these trials and he is, uh, should we say perfected alchemically or, Mm -hmm. or at least he's definitely special, he has to put himself into the unassuming attire. Um, and I think there's, uh, I think there's Saturnine symbols with all of this as well. Uh, he takes on, not only has he, has, has he been pushed back and given a limit, but yeah, now he has to conceal, um, his worth or his true identity here before he can go home. And while he's away, the horse did not eat, the bird did not sing, and the princess cried. As you said, Camian, those brothers didn't learn anything. They didn't do any of the work Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. the youngest child, the simpleton, had done. And so, again, this element of things just being for show, you know, we we can try to assume these abilities or these uh, levels of authority, but doing the work has its own rewards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anything else about anything else uh, about any of that? um, You know, it's a feeling of of there's, that's when there's, there's starting to form a sense of destiny, right? That this was meant to be because um, there's a familiarity that's with all the components of the quest now with the young prince and not with, you know, I, I think it's, it's even, uh, well, yes, they haven't done the work, but in, the, in, the, in his own way, the young prince has, has, has um, become into relation with the, the golden bird, the horse and the princess, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and that bond is the truth. And, you know, and, 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 well, you'll, you'll talk about how that plays out. <laughs> and it's like, nice. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, well, so he, he, he comes home, the, the, the son returns, he inherits the kingdom. The brothers, I believe are executed. And many years later, he finds the fox again, who's happy for him and says, once again, please cut off my head and chop off my paws. And you know, he asks and he asks until the now young king um, finally agrees. And he does, and the fox is transformed. And not only is he transformed into, you know, handsome young man or whatever, but he's the brother of the princess. So, if you really start thinking about this, this is where it goes, like, really meta. (laughs) No, but this is start. This is the part where where you start seeing strings attached all over the story. Because if the what if if the prince had listened to the fox's advice the whole way through, he actually never would have gotten mm-hmm. the princess. And was it the fox's? Was it the fox's end game for the prince to have all three? and he be reunited with his sister. Um, whether that's true or not, he did have his ulterior motives for helping the princes. He, he, you know, he attempted to help all three of them. He did have his ulterior motives, and those didn't work against the prince's cause, 
they were they were all able to work you know collaboratively towards their own goals and there is you know there are some um there are some uh, there are some spirit workers who do believe that when we work with spirits um just by our relation we are working towards their evolution as well just like we are being you know we're we're all in you know our race is in evolution it's not mm -hmm. like evolution you know only happened in in pre darwin um so that we're helping you know we're helping the their their evolution as well i don't know if i like necessarily that way of putting it but i will say they have their own reasons to be working with us as well mhm mm right um so my response so as a kabbalist i i actually like that projection and it's not that sure. um it's not that they're that now that we're all um the idea of tikkun the reckoning of the breaking uh of the shattering um which the shattering is not a fall the shattering is merely merely by function of creation that that the creation cannot contain the absolute infinity of the divine, so that's why it breaks, right? And so mm -hmm. then um, the goal of a Kabbalist is not, not that everyone has to be exalted back to the throne of God, but that everyone, everyone recognizes that they're a part of the throne, or they're, they're a part of the divine, and then, then there's unity again. And I think that that comes out, so when the princess, you know, uh, in the story, I cannot tell except that I was sad, and now I am joyful, it is... It is to me as if my rightful bridegroom had returned. And that, that's, at least that's the way I try to work with my spirits, is that we're in resonance, and as soon as we're not in resonance, we need to have a conversation. Like, what's going on here? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's, at least for me, even though I might use some medieval grimoires, to work away from the language that's in there, because out of respect and engagement of... We're all part of the creation, no matter where we are in the, in its manifestation. Y yes, that's exactly a good point about it. Um, if we want to say the princess, you know, I'm saying celestial, and and you've said goddess. If if we want to look at the princess that way, and now this fox is actually her her brother. I'm thinking how uh, sublunar spirits, infernal spirits, goetic spirits, visago are called demons but this one specifically this fox is telling us i'm actually brothers with that goddess up there and y y you know he's telling mm -hmm. us that he's not specifically a lowly infernal spirit even if that is the trappings he's been put in right now So I apologize to you guys. I said that both of these sh stories were going to be super short and I apparently looked at the wrong story when I said that because the golden bird was just as long, if not longer than Hansel and Gretel. However, the queen bee is really short. So hopefully we can, we can cover that one pretty quick, even though it's packed. <laughs> There's a lot in the queen bee as well. Um, yeah. The queen bee, again, we have three brothers. The simpleton is the youngest son, and he goes on a journey um, with his two older brothers. They pass creatures that live on the land, on water, and in the air, specifically. Um, and each time, the older brothers want to commodify the creatures for their own use. So they want to destroy the ant hills just because they can. They want to roast the ducks for their dinner, and they want to smoke out the bees so they can obtain the honey. And each time, the simpleton, who has a more of an animist view, um, says, no, I won't let you. And he saves those creatures. Eventually, they reach a stone castle. We come to another castle. This one is uh, stone, and all the people in it are stone, and all the horses are stone. And they come to a chamber, and in the chamber there's a door with three locks, and yet one keyhole that's open, and through the keyhole they can see a little gray man. I initially was going to um, save this episode, or save this story, to pair with a few that feature the gray man, 
but um, I think there's still enough where we can cover him in another in another episode. But but we'll talk about him a little bit because he's in the story. And uh, again, I get really strong Saturn symbolism with all of this: the stone castle, the old man, the locks that are covering the door. They have to knock three times before the little gray man responds silently, and the the chamber the uh the peephole the thrice knocking or calling out uh this whole seems very lodge ordeal to me um like a like a masonic initiation the mm -hmm. um the gray man gives them each a bedroom and lets them rest for the night silently again he doesn't speak in the morning he takes the oldest son and he brings him to a stone tablet on which is listed three tasks. The first task is to find the princess's pearls, which are lost under the moss. The first thing that comes to mind are pearls of wisdom. Um, and where are they? Especially since they're associated with the print. Uh, they're buried under moss <laughs> and or earth fur, as we like to call it. Um, but the thing, again, the princess could represent the goddess, the wisdom of the goddess, the pearls of the goddess that they're seeking. And they try to, the first two try to do it on their own and they come up short. The, the simpleton relies on the help of the ants or spirit. And you can, you can call those earth spirit, whatever spirit you want to call them. Um, and he gets all of the pearls and he's able to return those. Um, but yeah, the, the wisdom was the first thing that popped in my head, especially after we had discussed Hansel and Gretel, um, with the pearls of wisdom and, um, just, like I said, this one was my favorite, was actually one of my fa was my favorite out of the two, just because of the the animism the the uh the simpleton being made the hero the journey seems like an easy journey but not so much once you get into it i think it's interesting that this the whittling simpleton right but in yeah. my mind it's it's the it's 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 the it's the brother that's being childlike that's just um in wonder with nature, right? And why jacket, you know, seeing something and like you said, not trying to commoditize it. Uh, and, you know, uh, obviously that's a key lesson that we all need to learn in our modern world because we've, we've done just the opposite, right? Too much. Um, I, I, I can totally resonate with the pearls of wisdom. I, I, I think it's interesting of the three animals that are used, you know, ants, how they are, you know, they work in a collective. And like you said, very much our spirits, very much like what gnomes act like. Mm -hmm. um, ducks, of, of course, that whole family is very much uh, the mother goddess, you know, and, and as geese, etc. And then finally bees, um, you know, again, they worked as a collective, but they have this central, you know, the centralizing force um, on a totemic since bees are also special because in, mo in several traditions, they don't transmute as you go through the worlds. They are the true communicators. Um, and, and in this story, they're the ones that are going to seal the deal of, of who's, who's, who's the victor. One of the final hermetic texts, the, uh, a beehive is, is brought in poetically to symbolize the, the perfected state the perfected state of the pleroma. So I, I love that. And both these stories, especially this one, I think brings up so many things that we talked about in our last discussion episode about wonder and coming at things with, with a magical and animist mindset. And also the conflict between industrial modernity versus nature and the animist mindset, which in this story specifically, we see with the two brothers and the and the youngest simpleton 
and he's not a simpleton, mm -hmm. but they call him that because he has a different view than they do. He's not coming at it with an industrious mindset. He's coming at it from a sacred mindset because of that, because he can, he can recognize the, uh, and soldness of nature and works with the nature beings. Yeah. They're, they're able to, they're able to collaborate with him. Um, I love like waterfall, waterfowl in general, how they transcend realms and elements because they're aquatic, but they're also aerial and, and, mm -hmm. um, upper world. Um, the castle is restored and he is given the third princess and his brothers are in fact given the other two princesses so here finally the brothers are restored and due to um simpletons work and mindset uh everyone is able to benefit I thought it was funny, though, the way it was worded at the end, that the other two brothers were stuck with the other two sisters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it made me think very much. It made me It made me think a lot of Cinderella and the stepsisters. I was like, Ooh, Yeah, it wasn't written that way in, in, in the one that I read. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, ooh, wonder what was wrong with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they hadn't eaten honey, and and as we've heard, honey is is pretty perfect. Um, um, you know, no one says I'm going to take you to a, I I promise you a land that's flowing with milk and sugar syrup, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, again, it's it's golden and it's incorrupt, uncorruptible, mm -hmm. right? You you can preserve in honey. Um, wow, and, and, and it's and also certainly... and it's also a wound. It's also a healer. I mean, it, it can be used in healing wounds and, and things like that. So, um, but it's, it's, um, we don't need to process it to achieve the sweet substance either. So like early man, that was mm -hmm. one of the first truly sweet substances and calorie filled substances that they could find in between, you know, larger game and things like that. So there, you know, there is something miraculous about honey. Um, well, and that's what, that's what struck me because in finding the princess who had eaten honey, it healed the land. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I, I, especially when I was in the hospital over the month, during the month of December, um, one of the things w that was constantly told to me was that to, to fight the infection, I could actually dress the wound in honey. Wow. And I was like, never thought of that, <laughs> but it was in the honey and that the princess had ingested and her waking up that the healing of the land took place. You know, supposedly Alexander the Great was entombed in honey as a preservation, <laughs> right? Wow. Yeah, so, yeah. Mm. Then the Romans supposedly ran off with it. But I, I also want to circle back to, to reemphasize at the beginning where it says, uh, you know, speaking about the older brothers, they who were so much cleverer were unsuccessful. And again, I think that, again, this circles back to um, a lesson to learn about modernity of, of, you know, here we are in a critical state when, you know, so much of the last century and a half has been about success and, and driving and consuming, et cetera. And look at the pickle, pickle state we're in now. You know, of course, we're going to say nature sacred, and these these stories show that you should be kind to nature. And but but we've grown up in modernity, and I think it's easier to say these things than to um, than to really embody them and change our preconceptions, right? Change our automatic assumption. In that sense, it's worth. You know, it is worth repeating and, and to give examples in these stories. I'd like to talk again a little bit about um, spirit work, deity work as well, um, in that the princess, he has to uh, reclaim her pearls, and then he has to get her key from under the water before he's able to be worthy of entering the chamber 
to try to find her. And similar to how you talked about in the last story, Kami, and how how the young prince was building his relationship, his interpersonal skills from dealing with the bird to the horse to finally be able to deal with the princess. And um, we see that in spirit work too, where, uh, and, and, you know, and I, I know this is talked about already in, in, in other sources, but um, where it's not just the summoning, the invocation, the final offering to a deity or an infernal spirit or, or, or a nature spirit, whatever you're working with, but it's the whole process. It's the, it's the lead up. It's the purification. If you're doing that, it's the learning about them and, and, and what their correspondences are. And if you work on memorization, the memorization of those invocations and all of that actually is the spell. The invocation is, you know, is the final step, mm -hmm. but it's not the only step. And and here we see him going through all those steps to be able to make that make that final um, that final connection as part of the process. I also see it as a as a as an example of relationship building with spirit and and goddess God. Um, just because it it was a practice and empathy for him toward the the element of the of the earth spirits the the water spirits things like that but in exercising that empathy and that understanding and that compassion he built that relationship with them so that it was returned so that he could build even stronger relationship with the princess mm-hmm mm-hmm and I think that's what's like when we when we talk about these stories and we're interpreting, uh, you know, from our various traditions and from our various experiences of that's the way to approach spirit, right? Um, mm -hmm. You're holding space, you're setting the space up. Yes, it's the prepare preparation of yourself as the vessel or the manifester, but there's also the awareness of of you know. Are you engaging this spirit because it's a lineage of consciousness, right? And so you're tapping in that lineage because you're reconstructing to the best of degree of your research, et cetera, to do that. Um, are you also then that you're holding space? You're, you're wanting a relationship with this individual. So what are you going to do? You're going to call ahead and go, hey, can I, if I'm having you over for tea, what do you like? What kind of tea do you like? And what are the desserts you like? And so you have those there, right? Because that's what you, you are as a good host. Um, and then, of course, once you're there and you're talking in your relationship and they're at your house and they, they're learning about you and then you're each sparking like, oh, but because you like this and I kind of like this too, this is actually the preference dessert that I want you to have when I'm at your house, right? And that's when you deepen that relationship and that's when you're like, oh, you may, you know, all of you may work with the same god or goddess, but then this is how my altar is set up because this is the way that I've engaged that goddess or that god, right? And that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what true love is when you're adapting and you're being responsive. You're not just, oh, I'm filling it up with cold water just like I always have to do, right? But then, you know, maybe you put a little drop of rose, rose oil in it, things like that. So. Exactly, and I think that pulls on the personality of the deity. I mean we we become sometimes i think so used to that christianized version of a deity that we just see that mean grumpy god from upstairs instead of realizing that each deity we work with has its own has has their own individual personality um their likes their dislikes I'm sorry, my cats are like deciding that they want to get on the ancestral altar real fast. Um, I love that you bring up the the mean grumpy deity or scary grumpy deity because uh, this story has that connotation with the Saturn figure. And that's how a lot of people will view Saturn mm -hmm. and uh, maybe rightfully so. But he also leads them in this quest towards the final achievement and the and the um the restoration of the land and all three brothers um you know i would say representing all society um 
so there is there is uh precedent to work with uh saturn spirits as well because not only not only um can they limit and prevent but they can also allow mm -hmm. it's like the spirit that gives sickness also heals and saturn will make you work towards it and do the necessary you know make sure that you've taken the necessary preparations but then he will reward as as deserved right and i think you know to give let's see honest she. i think he, i think saturnian energies get um the bad rap because then when people people say they want to dive deep and then they're they're at the they're at the moment of like oh dude i have to do 50 push-ups i thought i was only going to have to do 20. you know and then, and when he and then when he's cracking the whips is like no you're going to do all 50. that that's the you know i think i think a lot of times Saturnian energies get that bad rap because people realize, oh my God, I really have to do this work. And, mm -hmm. and, and Saturn yep, that's when I bow have, out. Saturn has all the time in the world, but doesn't have time for BS. <laughs> Talking about the masculine deities too, like I work with Carnunas, and you have that duality. He's the god of life, but he's also the god of death. He's the god of the hunt, but he's the life bringer so it's learning that there's so much in the personality of each deity that it's not one way or another most of the deities incorporate every aspect of life i mean life death birth i mean growth you name it and seeing that here um, I think at least one key wisdom that is forgotten sometimes is curiosity, is, mm -hmm. is to stay curious. And even like, so then, you know, if we go back to the first story of, of okay, fine, he's not listening to the fox, but um, at some point, you know, self-responsibility is like, wait a second. First, the question, be curious about why am I not bloody listening to this fox? And two, why does the fox still stick with me, right? So keep asking, you know, Keeping that curiosity keeps communication flowing and, and um, helps you to not get as, uh, what I want to say, maybe the situations won't get as bad because you're constantly like, by being curious, you're constantly engaged and you're tr constantly trying to be aware. So you won't walk off that cliff when it was obvious the cliff was coming to an end. And with me on these, uh, the thing that, that struck me strongest was you had had representation of masculinity in its worst and its best forms. Um, I hate the phrase toxic masculinity, but <laughs> I'll use it here. Um, <laughs> you have the, the, the brothers who was it, it, the their inclination was arg let's kill it let's do this let's let's do damage but then you had the simpleton the younger brother that was compassionate that was empathetic that that wanted to see change and was willing to do what needed to be done to affect that change Mm -hmm. And who looked at his relationship with his, you know, with the world, his surroundings and his own kingdom as a guardianship as opposed to domination, you know, and especially in the most mm -hmm. modern senses of that. And a healthy skepticism, of course, will come in handy in our in our practice and our dealings with spirit. But the gift of the explorer, we say in our tradition, is courage. And I like that these aren't tales about necessarily fighting dragons because the courage is to proceed. You know, the courage is to trust that fox, even though that may seem silly or that may not seem what the populace wants you to do. The courage to go into the empty in as opposed to the popular in and uh, using that courage to uh, uphold our practice. Dave, would you be able to lead us in a spiritual exercise related to these stories? I definitely can. Um, 
we talked about sacred reading in our last um, talk, and I wanted to use a paragraph from the first story that we talked about. And the paragraph I want to use is the last paragraph because that impacted me so strongly. But I want to give you a little guideline. This is how I use divine reading. And it's just a formula that I've used over the years that have, I mean, even when I was working in the church. And the first principle is gather your thoughts. We've read the story. Think about what the story represents. Think about what it, how it touched you, where it, where it applied best to you. Focus your mind. Use what you've learned through the story. Focus on the intent behind the story. Invoke your intent. Control your power. This is a huge one for me. Because my first my first thought once I read through anything, I'm one of those that I'll, re I'll read a line and I'll form an opinion right then. I've had to learn to stop, control that, absorb more, then move forward. Harness your energy. That means take in the elements of the story. And then at the end, release the magic. Let it flow forth. So what I want to do is I want to read that last paragraph to you. And I want to guide you through part of what I do. But what became of the poor fox? Long afterwards, the king's son was going through the wood and the fox met him and said, Now you have everything that you can wish for. But my misfortunes never come to an end. And it lies in your power to free me from them now think about that phrase right there it lies in your power to free me and once more he prayed the king's son earnestly to slay him and cut off his head, head and feet so at last he consented and no sooner was it done than the fox was changed into a man and was no other than the brother of the beautiful princess and thus he was set free from a spell that had bound him for a long, long time. And now indeed, there lacked nothing to their happiness as long as they lived. So what I want you to do first is focus. Gather your thoughts. Think about what that one paragraph means to you. Where does this apply to your life, your practice, your craft? Once you've got that, focus your mind on one piece of that paragraph that you can own. Dwell on that for a minute. Hold it. Now invoke your intent behind that. For me, it was the transformation of the fox after his head was cut off and his feet. Because in cutting off the head, it changed the train of thought. The fox was no longer there. In cutting off the feet, the direction was changed. He no longer moved in the direction of the fox. He was transformed at that point into the princess's brother. The next part is control your power. Control your preconceived notions behind this. Control even what we've talked about. And let spirit take over there. Harness your energy. Now's the time to build that that ball of energy that the story, that that one paragraph holds. Whether it be transformation, whether it be joy, whether it be happiness. And then release that magic. This is where we pour out into the community around us. 
This is where we take what we've learned in that one story, that one paragraph. How do we help transform others? What do we have to help them kill in themselves? Kill in themselves so that their magic is released. Thoughts? The very last part of that, it might be about our perception of the others that is being shattered as opposed to something that we're enabling them to shatter. Um, mm -hmm. It's something I hadn't... Uh, we, we mentioned the princess also being like an alchemical earth or salt, but in this instance, I could also see her as the alchemical contestants, which um, mm -hmm. uh, coincidentally is also the ritual that we use to celebrate the explorer. And in that case, the purified spirit essence of the material object which was the fox which is then separated and putrefied and then perfected i'm also thinking about that stray dog that wandered into my life this week because i just had him neutered so i i had some things cut off and and i've been feeling really bad about it but um <laughs> but now he could now he could reach a different potential <laughs> exactly Are you keeping him? Yeah, I kept him. In the long run, he's he like, will be more than... He's like, what kind of house of horrors did I choose? <laughs> <laughs> uh, any closing statements, some things you want to let us know about? I do have a course coming up on March 5th um, that um, I'll be doing via Zoom. It's called Poking the Sleeping Line. It's invoking passion back into your craft. Um, so keep an eye out. Uh, it's on my Facebook page. Um, I've got it on Instagram. All that good stuff. Once again, until we meet again, may your travels in fairy be filled with wonder.